Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dan Lerner. I'm Associate Dean for Arts and Sciences here at the college, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to this session. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome, in, in particular, uh, Professor Jillian Hendershot right here in the front row. Um, to this, the inaugural History of Gender and Sexuality Conference at GRCC. Uh, we're very, very pleased to have you join us, Jillian. Thank you for being here. Uh, a quick word or two about uh, Professor Hendershot before she takes the, the microphone. Um, she's currently in her fifth year teaching in the Department of History at Grand Valley State, where she is a visiting assistant professor. And there she teaches a variety of classes in European, world, and American history, as well as a specialized course in the history of witch trials. She's also taught at Central Michigan University in past years. Uh, Professor Hendershot is currently completing a PhD in history from Central Michigan and the University of Strathclyde. And in doing that, she is completing a dissertation titled Witches, Wizards, and Marginalized Men, Gender, Accusation, and Conviction in Witch Trials in 17th Century England and Colonial New England. Uh, and Professor Hendershot mentioned to me a little while ago that this project um, establishes the role of gender dynamics in 17th century witch witchcraft crises in two places, East Anglia, England, and Salem, Massachusetts. And in particular, she is examining gender roles to determine the impact that male and female society and familial roles had on witch trials. Uh, this dissertation should be noted has benefited from a lot of support from different places, uh, most notably Central Michigan University, uh, but in addition to that, um, the American Historical Association's Michael Krauss Research Grant in Colonial American History. Um, some of Professor Hendershot's other areas of interest include the history of domestic violence, and recently she presented a talk titled, Oh Dreadful Dreadful Are Ministers Which Is Two, Churchmen Accused of Witchcraft in Early Modern Europe and that was done at the Center for Inquiry here in Grand Rapids. Today, we're very fortunate to have Professor Hendershot here presenting a talk on Gender Imps in the Witches' Mark, Reassessing Women and Men's Roles as Accused Witches in Early Modern England. Everybody, please welcome me in joining Professor Jillian Hendershot. Okay, so I just dropped my microphone, so give me just a second. All right, well, thank you for inviting me here today, and thank you to Dan Lerner for that introduction. The topic that I'm going to be looking at today is the issue of the witch trials in English society, and the way we're going to be looking at it is as a mechanism for understanding gender constructs, gender identity, and gender subversion in the early modern period. It's a very, very important topic because most histories of the witch trials tend to focus on either women or men who've been accused of witchcraft. And in particular, a lot of histories tend to focus on patterns of accusation in witch trials. So what we're going to do instead is look at masculine and feminine fantasies of witchcraft and the experiences of men and women following an accusation. Because doing this really helps us to better understand gender dynamics and how women and men's experiences as accused witches are very, very different and very unique. But before we get to that, I think it's fairly constructive to start out with an examination of what witchcraft actually is and what it means. And this is something I think is very important because most of the understanding that we have about witchcraft is really rooted in modern pop culture. And when people think of witches, they tend to go to this very, very stereotypical image, the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. She is older, she is ugly, she has a big conical hat, she's got a broomstick, she dresses all in black, and she's a malevolent figure, but at the same time she is also a figure of fun. She's someone who is never able to get the best of Dorothy. She's someone who's always doomed to failure, and no matter how hard she tries, she fails again and again. And it's this idea, this fantasy, this idea of a woman who is elderly and this is just this pure personification of evil that people do tend to think of and it is a joke and it is something that people don't tend to take terribly seriously. The idea of the witch in the early modern period is somewhat the same. You do still see the broomstick, the conical hat, 
But rather than being a figure of fun, the figure of the witch in the early modern period is a very, very malevolent figure. And it's something that people were very, very afraid of. And it might be difficult for us to understand today, but the people of Europe absolutely believed in witchcraft. They were terrified of witches. They were scared of what witchcraft could do, how it could impact them on a social and economic level, how it could impact their very lives itself. So for the people who live in the communities all over the continent of Europe, the threat of evil magic was very simply a tangible, albeit terrible part of their lives. It was something they had to deal with. And it was very, very vital to try and avoid the lures of a witch or the spells of a witch. These were beliefs that existed for decades, in fact, centuries all over Europe. And again, this is just another very stereotypical image of the witch from the early modern period, although it's a more modern representation. Again, you have the elderly woman, she's making a potion in a cauldron, and it's all very scary and frightening for people. But if we're actually thinking about a witch and who a witch is, the actual term witchcraft in English is a term that is very difficult for us to assess because it has many, many different meanings and it's the subject of an enormous amount of debate. Um, in its most general sense, the word witch has been understood throughout most of human history. It's someone who possesses a supernatural, occult, or other type of mysterious power in which they cause misfortune, misery, or harm to other people. Witches defined in this very broad, very general sense generally share a number of different characteristics. They tend to be fairly isolated from <coughs> their community. They'll live alone, they're widowed, they don't have any children. They generally tend to be economically marginalized. Someone who has an envious or a malicious personality, someone who has a bad community reputation, such as failure to go to church, someone who engages in unacceptable behavior, like having illicit love affairs, public drunkenness, so on and so forth. And this type of magic, this type of evil activity, using magic for personal gain to cause misfortune and injury to other people is called maleficia. And just very generally, that means the use of dark, malevolent magic for personal gain. And this is something that has always existed in European society from prehistor prehistorical times, as far as we can understand them, all the way through into the early modern period. And this is just an image from the early 1500s, and it shows exactly what I mean. You have two witches, in this case, they're both women, they are throwing various articles into a cauldron. This woman's got a snake. This one has a rooster. And they're doing this so that they can change weather patterns, so that they can make it rain, which will then cause misery to other people. And this is just a very standard way that people understood witchcraft. But during the early modern period, and this is the time period that we're going to be talking about today, the early modern period, Historians can't agree about anything, but generally it's the period 1450 through 1750, although a lot of people would disagree with that, but they're wrong. It's 1450 <laughs> through 1750. The term witchcraft undergoes a massive transformation, and the word witch in witchcraft becomes much more precise. The witch becomes a person who consorts with Satan, and in doing so, the witch makes a pact with the devil in exchange for magical powers. Before this time period, people were thought to just have innate magical abilities. Some people were just born with them. After the start of the early modern period, for a whole variety of reasons, people start to think that no, people are not born with these abilities. Satan gives certain people those abilities. And he does this, of course, because it's Satan and he wants to destroy godly Christian Europe and he needs helpers to do this. So witches will sign their souls over to Satan and they'll get the ability to perform <coughs> acts of magic. 
and they would get together, they would worship the devil collectively, they would sacrifice and eat babies, they would engage in deviant sexual practices, they would mock the rituals of Christianity. And these gatherings were called Sabbaths, and people were very, very afraid of them. Witches were believed to be members of a pact of very dangerous heretics, and a heretic is someone who goes against the teachings of the church. And they were using magic to try and destroy godly Christian Europe and all of the good and all of the morality that existed within godly Christian uh, Europe. So defined in this way, witchcraft becomes basically the most serious crime imaginable. It involves all different kinds of felonies, all different kinds of regular criminal activity, like murder, or infanticide, cannibalism, and so on and so forth, along with the very worst spiritual crimes like heresy, blasphemy, treason against God, and so on and so forth. So this is how people understood witchcraft. But it's also very, very important to bear in mind that most historians are very skeptical about the reality of the crime of witchcraft. And that is something that's very important. Witchcraft is a real phenomenon, just very simply does not exist. And I don't mean to say that to squash anyone's particular spirituality or beliefs and so on and so forth, but actual acts of witchcraft, changing weather patterns, turning people into toads, whatever it happens to be, it doesn't exist in a real tangible sense. Of course, that doesn't mean that we should dismiss people who believed in witchcraft in the past as superstitious or idiotic. For these people, witchcraft was a real tangible event in their lives. It's something that explained all of the misfortune and all of the misery that befell them on a constant, constant basis. So it doesn't really matter that witchcraft, in a very real sense, doesn't exist. People believed that it exists, and that makes it a real phenomenon. So before we look at our topic today, which is gender, imps, and the witch's mark, which is, of course, a very excellent way to understand gender and witch trials, I think it's important to also say a few words about gender in witch trials because this is one of the things that is very important and also incredibly misunderstood about the witch trials. It is very, very well known that, statistically speaking, most of the people who were accused of witchcraft were women. About 75% of the people who were accused were women. And a lot has been made of this figure. It's something that a lot of people have thought about, a lot of people have considered. Many historians research why women were singled out for persecution, why people considered witchcraft to be a feminized crime. I'd suggest that looking at patterns of witchcraft and witchcraft accusations is a very, very useful thing to do. But if we want to understand the role that gender really played in the witch trials, it is important to move away from this idea that because more women were accused, we have to understand it as a simply feminized crime that does limit how we can understand this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, on a purely statistical level, the ratio of male to female witch cases is very, very flawed. And I'll admit up front that I minored in statistics and I can go on for a very long time about statistically speaking, but statistically speaking, the witch trials are not uniform. Not every country had 75% of their accused witches as women. For example, Russia, or more correctly, Muscovy, the ratio is completely reversed. 75% of the people who were accused there in Muscovy are men. In parts of Northern Europe, in Finland and Iceland, although not that many people were accused in general there, but that figure jumps to 90%. 90% of the people who were accused were men. In France, that figure is much more equal. About 50% of the people accused were men. About 50% of the people accused were women. So the idea that everywhere there are 75% of the people who were accused 
are women universally doesn't really hold up. So then making generalities about why women are accused of witchcraft also doesn't hold up because if the statistics don't match up everywhere, the reasons for accusations don't hold up everywhere. Secondly, if we consider the general reasons why people are accused of witchcraft, there's not really, and a lot of people again would disagree with this, but again, they're very, very wrong. There's not really that much difference in the reasons why women were accused of witchcraft and why men were accused of witchcraft. Almost always, in a very general sense, involves some type of ostracizing, some type of marginalizing. In other words, it's a process of othering people. Where we see differences are in the specific forms of marginality or ostracizing or othering, however you want to describe it. People who are at the outside of their society, people who sit on the margins, people who are socially or economically different, people who are too poor or people who are conversely are too wealthy can be accused of witchcraft. And we'll just let it go for a second, but it's not gonna end. So I'll just talk over the top of it. Other things that can happen can be peer, gender, religious, political differences. There's all different reasons why someone can be marked out as different within their community, but almost always this is the root of a witchcraft accusation. Where we can start to see the significance of gender differences in witch trials, it's more important, I would argue, to look at the post accusation experiences of a witch. Once someone has been arraigned for witchcraft and taken into custody, once they are interrogated and people start to question the witch and what the witch did, that's where we start to see the very distinct differences between masculine and feminine experiences in witch trials. Not so much in terms of why they're accused, but then what happens after they're accused. And that's what we're going to look at today. Obviously, understanding the causes of accusations is very, very significant. But understanding gender and social roles, you have to look at these post-accusation experiences. And this is what I'm going to talk about, the ways that people treated, viewed, fantasized about witches is fundamentally different based on a person's perception of a witch's gender identity. Again, before we look at some of the specifics of this, it's also important to give you a couple of pieces of information about the particular witch trial that we're going to be looking at. And all of the examples that I'm going to give you all come from <coughs> one particular witch trial. It's a very, very famous trial that takes place in England between 1645 in 1647 and it's a really for want of a better word it's a really bizarre series of events and it involves a man called Matthew Hopkins who was a self-proclaimed witch finder not just a witch finder but a witch finder general this is not a title that he's given by any official body he's not appointed by a government to hunt for witches he's not given this job by the military or by local magistrates. He just decides one day, kind of like you do, that he's just going to be a witch finder general. He adopts this title, gets his best friend, and the two of them go off and start hunting for witches. And where they hunt for witches is in a place in England called East Anglia. And just to show you this, it's a very anachronistic map. I'd just like to point out in the 1600s, there was no airport in um, East Anglia. But if this is a map of England down here, this region in the square is East Anglia. And this is it um, much larger. So it's down in the southeastern portion of England. And it's a very important place because while Matthew Hopkins is active, England is in the midst of a civil war, completely 
destructive to English society. And a lot of the major battles were actually fought in East Anglia. It's really a sort of center of the Civil War action. People's lives were completely upturned by this civil war. It's very, very destructive, and it causes a lot of angst and a lot of misery for people. And this is why Matthew Hopkins is able to prosper and make himself a witch hunter or the witch finder general. And nobody is there to stop him because the complete the legal system in England has completely broken down. Parliament's not in session. There is no judicial oversight. The king has no idea what's going on from here to there. In fact, the king is about to lose his life. And it's just a very, very destructive period. And people who want to exploit that, like Matthew Hopkins, it's a very easy time for them to manipulate and deceive people to achieve their own agendas. And what actually happens is Matthew Hopkins was a very, very young man at the time of the witch trials. He was in his mid-twenties. We don't really know that much about his life. He was the son of a clergyman, a minister, and he was actually a legal clerk before the Civil War started, and he was a member of the Puritan faith, uh, fairly fanatical branch of Calvinism. And we don't actually know why he was not involved in the Civil War himself, because he fully supported the anti-King faction, the, the legions of Oliver Cromwell. But for some reason, he doesn't actually get involved in the fighting himself. And he was living in a small village in East Anglia. It's called Manning Tree. And one night, so the story goes, Matthew Hopkins actually writes extensively about this. And this is how we know so much about what happened. But he goes out for a walk one night and he encounters a group of women in the forest. And he decides to stay and watch them for a while because you know, I guess that's what you would do. And after he's been watching them, he's hiding behind some bushes in the forest and he writes about this. He realizes that it's not just a group of women who are meeting together, it's clearly a group of witches. And he becomes very, very concerned at this point. And he realizes that if these witches figure out that he's been watching them, they're going to kill him. So he tries to back away very slowly, but he steps on a branch or something and makes a noise. The witches all kind of whip around and they see him and realize that they've been caught, at least according to Matthew Hopkins. And instead of chasing him, he says that they conjure up a bear, and that bear then chases Matthew Hopkins. But Matthew Hopkins, being apparently very, very fast and wily, manages to outrun the bear and get back to his house. And this is his story. Again, I keep saying this, but we don't really know what was going on, whether he actually saw anyone in a forest or whether he just bumped into two people accidentally, whether they had a dog or whether there actually really was a bear just lurking about England in the 1600s. But whatever happened, he became convinced that there was a massive nest of witches living in his local community. Because there's no legal system in place because of the Civil War, he decides it's down to him and other dedicated citizens to get rid of these witches. So, like I said, he gathers up his best friend, who's called John Stern, and then the two men then travel about for the next two years, rounding up anyone that they think is a witch and having them interrogated, in many cases, executed. In that two-year period, Matthew Hopkins discovers about 300 witches. About half of those witches were actually put to death. And all of a sudden, in 1647, Matthew Hopkins just kind of disappears. Nobody really knows for sure what actually happened to him, whether a mob finally caught up with him, whether he died, whether he left for some other reason. We really don't know. But all of a sudden, in 1647, these trials just come to an end. And all of the examples that we're going to look at today all come from this area. And the reason that this trial in particular is so important is because it gives us a wealth of information about the role that gender played in the conduct of witch trials through widespread information about a very particular aspect of witch trials. And that aspect is the witch's familiar.
or imps as they're also known. And this is a type of belief system that crops up all over Europe, but is especially significant to this trial because almost every witch who was accused is also thought to have a relationship with one of these creatures, with an imp or a familiar. And the way that each witch was thought to interact with that familiar spirit demonstrates a lot about how people in the 1600s thought about gender, understood gender, and understood ideas and concepts about masculine and feminine behavior. And again, before we look at some concrete examples of this, I suppose it's vital to understand what we're talking about when we, I say a familiar. This image here actually shows, again, a fairly stereotypical witch who's actually feeding some of these so-called familiar spirits. So. To start out with what is a familiar, the image here actually shows a witch alongside some of her familiars. Again, it's a very stereotypical image of a witch. And she's elderly, she's very impoverished, she doesn't have any shoes on. And she's surrounded by several different animals. Some of them are fairly recognizable, like this fish. Other ones are much more outlandish. You've got this sort of lizard-like creature that has wings and so on and so forth. Basically, if we're talking about what a familiar is, there are multiple different terms that people use. Most commonly, people talk about imps or they talk about familiars, but they're also referred to as spirits or demons as well. Whatever the term used, whether it's imp, familiar, spirit, or demon, what a familiar was thought to be was a demon are a demonic creature that had taken animal form and was thought to be, at least in the 1600s, something that had been sent to a witch by Satan to act as his proxy. Satan, of course, is busy running the legions of hell and he's got lots of witches to administer and he's a very, very busy individual. So he couldn't actually be everywhere that all of his witches needed him. So he would send the familiars to really work in his stead. So they're really like his eyes and his ears. Although these imps look like animals, and again, you can see that from the image there, which is from 1621 in England, they're distinguished from so-called normal animals because familiars were thought to have traits and abilities that other regular animals did not have. First of all, people thought that familiars could talk. There are lots and lots of reports by witch hunters who claimed that they had had interaction with familiars, these animals. They were described as having really deep, guttural voices that were very spooky and supernatural that didn't really sound human. They did speak English, which was very lucky for the witch hunters in England, but they they don't talk in a, a normal fashion. And this is one of the most bizarre aspects of the witch trials. Men like Matthew Hopkins, this witch finder general, would claim that when they captured a witch, what they would do was keep the witch awake for as long as possible. And there are a number of different reports where Matthew Hopkins would keep someone consistently awake for about two or three days at a time. They would prevent the witch from ever sitting down. They would move the man or the woman back and forward constantly and keep him or her on their feet so that they could never fall asleep. And the theory was that if you did this for long enough, if you made the witch distressed enough, he or she would eventually become so desperate to get out of this situation that they would summon their familiar spirit, this agent of Satan who would come and help them. And when the familiar spirit showed up, this would expose them once and for all as a witch. However, these people are being held in early <coughs> modern prisons, which are not nice places. They're very dank, they're very filthy. And what ended up happening was Hopkins would claim that the familiar spirits would show up. But what he reports as showing up in these instances are things like flies and bees 
and rats. So you're in an early modern prison and there's very horrific circumstances and conditions. Someone, this hapless witch, would be awake for about three days. A fly would come buzzing into her interrogation chamber and Matthew Hopkins took this is absolute evidence that this was a witch's familiar. So in that sense, it's very, very convenient information. But it still gets more bizarre because Hopkins would then go on to claim that he would talk to the familiar, this fly, and that the fly would then talk back to him. So he gives all these reports, and on the basis of this happening, the fly buzzing in and then having a nice conversation with Matthew Hopkins, the witch was clearly guilty, and several people were actually executed because a fly had come into their interrogation chamber. So in that sense, it's hard to know the honesty of the witch hunters, whether Matthew Hopkins really believed that he was interacting with flies, which raises a whole separate set of issues, or if he really was just very manipulatively playing with what happens and taking any opportunity he could to convict the witch, which is much more likely, but we don't really know whether he genuinely believed that he was interacting with these creatures. These creatures who take the form of small domestic animals or other types of vermin were also thought to have supernatural strength and supernatural survival abilities. And again, a really, really good example of this comes from the Matthew Hopkins trials. A local dignitary, a very well-to-do man called Sir Thomas Bowes, came forward to give evidence at the trial of a witch called Anne West. And this was an elderly woman. She was actually the first person accused by Matthew Hopkins. And she was a fairly, as much as we can see, a stereotypical witch. She was a fairly stereotypical witch. She was elderly. She didn't really have much by way of family. She had one daughter. She had no one else that she could depend on. And she was physically disabled. She had one leg. And she's the first person accused by Matthew Hopkins. And Thomas Bowes, this very well-to-do witness against um, Anne West, comes forward to say that one afternoon he had been out for a walk and he was walking past Anne West's house and he saw that the front door to her home was actually open. So he decided, again, it's not really clear why, but he decided that it would be a really good idea to stick his head into her house to see what was going on, why her front door was open. And this is an actual quote from the trial records. Bowles explained that he looked into the house and presently there came three or four little things in the shape of black rabbits that were leaping and skipping all around the house. They leaped and they skipped over to him, to Bowes. And Bose, who had a good stick in his hand, struck at them, thinking to kill them, but he could not. But at last he caught hold of one of the rabbit creatures and held the body of it in one hand and beat the head of it against his stick with the other, intending to beat out its brains. But when he could not kill the rabbit in this way, he took the body of it in one hand and the head of it in another and endeavoured to wring off the head of the rabbit. And he wrung and he stretched the neck. Out between its hand, his hands it came like a lock of wool, yet would not give over to his intended purpose. However, he knew of a spring not far off and went to drown it. But as he went, he fell down and he could not stand back up again, but he would fall over again and again. So at last he crept upon his hands and knees until he came to the body of water. Holding it fast in his hand, he put it under the water up to his elbow and held the rabbit under the water for a good space of time until he conceived that it must be drowned. Then he let it go. It sprung up out of the water into the air and vanished. And this was taken as concrete proof that this woman, Anne West, was a witch. And on the strength of this testimony from a man who had looked into her house and, well, basically stolen one of her rabbits and tried to kill it in lots of grisly ways, 
Anne West was then put to death for the crime of witchcraft because this man could not kill her rabbit. And if you leave aside the whole sociopathical, uh, pathological issues involved in doing this, this shows that it's very, very difficult for witches to overcome the charge of witchcraft once familiars get involved because anyone can claim anything about these creatures and it's very hard to fight against it. But overall, the function of a familiar was to provide aid and assistance for witches in the exercise of his or her evil witchy tasks, whatever they might happen to be. The theory was that the devil had sent these um, creatures to help the witches. For example, a man called John Chambers was accused of witchcraft during the course of the East Anglia trials. And he claimed that when he had signed his soul over to Satan, <coughs> Satan had provided him with two toads and a cat. And that he had used the two toads and the cat to help him First of all, destroy the livestock of some rival farmers. He thought his neighbours were far too prosperous in comparison to himself. So he has his familiars kill the livestock. And then he decides that his wife is much too fertile. She's been producing way too many children year after year after year. And he's kind of sick of being a father. So he asks his familiars and he confesses all of this under torture, but he does confess it all, that he sent his familiars to kill all of his children. And sure enough, all of his children do die. And he argues that he used familiars to do it. Again, there's probably some very deep psychological issues. The man's children did die. And, you know, probably, I'm sure he'd be the only parent who ever did this, but probably one day he was muttering about, you know, if you have kids, you have nothing else. And, um, was concerned about the fact that he had children and then all of his children die and there's some kind of guilt issue at work there. But he does state that he uses familiars to do this. They help him achieve his ends and his goals. Another woman called Jane Wallace stated that her familiars that were sent to her by Satan um, realized that she was very, very impoverished. So every time they came to visit her, they would bring her a big bushel of money and that helped her out financially. And then another woman called Catherine Tooley had gotten into an argument with the local parish priest and or parish minister, sorry, and she wanted her imps to kill the parish minister. But they tried and they tried, and it ends up that they can't actually kill a man of God. He was much too powerful for them. But again, she confesses that she tries to use them for her own social means or what she wants to accomplish. One of the most important things to understand through all of this is that these familiars don't just do this according to the witchcraft documents. They don't just do this because they have to. The relationship between a witch and the familiar is a reciprocal relationship. The imp was not just bound to do whatever the witch wanted. Instead, the imp has to get something out of this arrangement as well. And what the imp actually wants is blood. And the imps have to have this if they're going to survive. It's their main source of nutrition. So the imps, according to beliefs at the time, would agree to perform various different tasks like the one Chambers, Wallace and Tully wanted in exchange for the witch nourishing the familiar from their body. And this leads us to the idea of familiars and the so-called witch's mark which was one of the most damning pieces of evidence that was used against witches during the course of the witch trials. It's very, very infamous in the history of the witch trials. The witch's mark was viewed as one of the most concrete pieces of evidence against a witch. Consequently, prosecutors worked very, very hard to try and find a witch's mark. And they used a whole host of different intrusive, torturous, and at times false methods to try and detect these marks. <clears throat> 
Searchers would examine a witch and look for evidence that would demonstrate that he or she had been feeding a witch from their body, that they had been nourishing the, the familiar, by the, or the suspected witch had been nourishing the familiar. And this process would invariably leave a mark. The imp would basically suckle from the witch's body and it would leave some kind of mark, which would usually be a fairly innocuous thing. Of course, again, people are not really feeding <coughs> animals from their, their body, at least I presume most people were not doing this. And again, it's just part of this fantasy of witchcraft, the idea that people would do this. And this is what people believe, it's not what was actually happening. And it's this process of trying to find these witches' marks that leads to very clear differences between men and women's experiences as accused witches. And what the witch hunters were looking for was any kind of mark. It could be something like a, a birthmark or a cluster of moles, anything that would show that there was something that had been feeding from their bodies. But it does highlight very clear differences between men and women because for female witches and the familiar relationship was often portrayed as a sexual relationship. Descriptions about how female witches fed their familiars and where witches' marks were located was usually something that involved very crude descriptions of the female witch's genitalia. Matthew Hopkins in particular wrote extensively about the strangeness of some women's vaginas and how this strangeness clearly indicated that this woman was a witch. <coughs> This is not something that we find in, in male cases. Men were never accused of feeding witches from their genitalia and there were never had their body parts discussed in such a way that they had strange genitalia or normal genitalia. It's something that is very, very specific to women. So this type of evidence is completely lacking in male cases. Men were thought to feed familiars, but it never involved their genitalia. And quite often men like Matthew Hopkins would claim that women would let their familiar spirits live in their genitalia and various other things that they would nest there and that they would sleep there and eat there and so on and so forth. Again, this is something that is entirely lacking in male witchcraft cases. So there's no lurid fantasies involved for men. Um, however, some men were, of course, accused of still feeding their familiars, but it's never from these areas. Usually it involved a witch's mark on their back or their shoulder or some other body part like that. It never has that sexual dimension. And both men and women were searched for witches' marks and other alleged telltale bodily signs of witchcraft and collusion with the devil. Some telltale signs included things like supernumerary nipples, which you would find in both men and women. You would also th find things like skin discolorations. If someone was unfortunate enough to be born with a birthmark, which is a very natural thing. But if someone has this birthmark and they're accused of witchcraft, people would argue that the birthmark was actually caused by familiar spirits sucking blood from their bodies. Or in the case of female witches only, and this is actually a quote from Matthew Hopkins, she would have teats or bigs, which is more or less a word for hemorrhoids, in her secret parts. In other words, somewhere on her genitalia. And this is something that very, very frequently crops up in witchcraft investigations. Witch hunters were obsessed with finding the idea of a standardized female genitalia and that anyone who didn't have genitalia that met their very precise mandates about what was a proper looking vagina, etc., would be a witch. And in actuality, most English evidence is actually very, very <coughs> explicit in detailing the discovery of the witch's mark on 
female witches genitalia. It's very crude, it's very lurid, it's very, it's very gory in many ways in how they describe it, particularly once they start recommending methods for finding these witches' marks. One of the most common methods that they recommended was using a device known as a pricker. And what they would do is, it's just basically something that looks kind of like a pen, and it has a big long needle point on it at the end, and they would stick that needle into the witch's mark, because the theory was that if you do this, a witch's mark will be completely insensitive to pain because it's been suckled by a familiar. So they would look for the witch's mark and they would stick the witch's body with this big long instrument. And of course, witch hunters recommended that people who were searching women do this to their genitalia. So I mean, it then takes on this very, very gory dynamic beyond the personal invasion of actually examining women's genitalia. So it's a very, very crude, invas invasive, and incredibly painful search that's conducted on women. And again, this does not happen <coughs> in male cases. For example, a couple of instances of this. One man called Thomas Everard claimed that he had a big black dog that was his familiar spirit and that he did feed this big black dog that he gets from Satan. But what he says is that the black dog, whenever it wants some um, food or nourishment, it will put a small cut on the back of his ear and drink blood from there. Another person who was accused, a vicar called John Lowe's, had a supernumerary nipple on the back of his head and had another one under his chin that he was accused and then confessed to using to help him feed his familiars. However, in, in women's cases, this was almost always something that involved their genitalia. For example, a woman called Mary Greenleaf, who was also accused by Matthew Hopkins, had a group of people examine her secret parts, again, this is a quote, looking for teats or bigs, and they found some. They looked not like normal hemorrhoids, nor were they in the places where women were usually troubled by hemorrhoids, but they very much looked as if they had been sucked and recently by her imps because the informants, the people who had done the examining, have been formally employed to search other women suspected of witchcraft. And this defendant, Mary Greenleaf's secret parts look very similar to other accused witches. So women who had um, very distinctive or had very distinctive marks on or around their genitalia would just automatically be considered a witch. And other differences that we can see where the witch's mark is involved include when we look at the physical examination of witches. In terms of differences, both men and women were subject to physical exams. This is not something that was done exclusively to women, nor was it done exclusively to men. But the physical examination is very, very significant in understanding the differences between male and female witches. It becomes very apparent that following an accusation of witchcraft, the experiences of men and women incredibly different. This is actually an image from the 1800s and it shows, it's supposed to actually represent the Salem witch trials, but again, it wasn't actually contemporary to the period. And what you have are a group of people who are examining a woman in public to try and find her witch's mark. And it's much more dignified than what really happened. I guess, you know, the reality of it might have been a bit too graphic for a painting from the Victorian era, but it does show people examining witches in public, looking for these witches' marks. But the big difference is, in terms of looking for the witches' mark, men were examined by medical professionals, such as they existed. Usually, physical examinations were conducted by a group of the suspected witches' gender peers. So in the case of men, they're examined by local doctors, people who have actually had some degree of medical training. 
And women, on the other hand, were not searched by doctors. That was considered very inappropriate to have a man examine a woman's genitalia. That was not at all seemly. You do tend to hear reports from general histories of Europe that say that male witch hunters would examine female witches themselves and they would invade their, their privacy and examine their genitalia. For the most part, that doesn't really happen. It does tend to be people's gender peers. But of course, the problem is Men are examined by medical professionals, but in this time period, there's no such thing as a place for women within the medical establishment. So women are examined by so-called local women of worthy character. And women are brought into this situation, they are invited, if they're considered to be an upstanding good woman, they're invited to come in and examine other local women who've actually been accused of witchcraft to discover if their genitalia is in fact normal. Most of these women who come in, these women of worthy character, have absolutely no medical training whatsoever. These are not the women in communities who work as midwives or what we would think of as folk healers, because those are the types of women who are very often accused of witchcraft. Instead, to be a woman of worthy character meant you were an upstanding member of your local church, and that was the only criteria you needed to be a female witch's mark finder. So, of course, this is very, very difficult for people who are accused of witchcraft because the major qualification for people who basically have their lives in their hand is the fact that these women are of upstanding character. So, it's significant for a number of ways. First of all, it shows that, again, unlike standard interpretations that generally say that male witch hunters abused female witches. Women were very actively involved in the legal process in hunting out witches. They were given positions whereby they effectively held the lives of their community peers in their hands. And this would empower some women and really devalue the, the lives of, of other women because you know, these women really didn't have any particular knowledge of female genitalia or women's reproductive systems other than the fact that they themselves were women. One very notable example of this is a very famous witch hunter called Mary Phillips. And she was actually the third associate of John Stern and Matthew Hopkins, and the three of them would actually travel about together quite often. Hopkins and Stern would discover the witches, and all of the female witches would be turned over to Mary Phillips, and she would examine to find out if they had the witches' mark. She was not someone who had ever had children. She had never gotten married, so presumably she was still a virgin. She had never really had any particular experience that would allow her to be a good and successful hunter of the witches, Mark. She was just considered to be a godly Christian woman, and that was the entire basis of her expertise. And every single person she found inevitably had a witch's mark and she found many, many women, actually well over a hundred women, guilty of the crime of witchcraft. And again, this really does highlight how difficult it is for women to escape their, their charges because typically, once the male medical professionals got involved, they would be very quick to dismiss witches' marks on male witches. They would point out that it was actually just a, a skin <coughs> tag or a wart or a mole. And there are lots of accounts of men actually escaping conviction because they were examined by someone who had an understanding Understanding of human anatomy and what different bodily marks looked like, whereas the women were examined by other women who were just people who had a so-called worthy character, and it was their job to identify if that 
witches' genitalia looked normal or not, and inevitably their genitalia did not look normal. So it was much easier to convict a woman in that respect. So that's another way that we can see very profound differences between men and women's experiences following an accusation of witchcraft. Finally, we have sexual relationships with Satan. There are many, many women in the records of the East Anglia trials who confessed that they had had carnal relationships with the devil. And again, the picture there is from the mid-1500s, and it shows a woman who is thought to be a witch, and she is cuddling with not a normal human man, it's actually a, a devil or a demon. He's only got three fingers, where she's got you know all five, and he's also got um, talons for feet, and he has a tail as well. So this is a representation of, of sex with the devil. And again, it's very important to remember that most of these women who confessed that they had had sex with the devil had been subject to torture. A particularly, again, favorite method of interrogation that Hopkins used was sleep deprivation, which is actually, in modern studies, has been found to be one of the most effective methods of interrogation because people will break down mentally very, very quickly when they're sleep deprived. But for example, a woman called Ellen Driver, again from East Anglia, confessed that after she had been awake for three days and two nights, she confessed that an imp did suck on her body and that the devil had frequently appeared to her as a man and that she was actually married to Satan, that he had lived with her for three years and she had given him two children. And he had said that after they were married, he would have his carnal use of her. But whenever they had carnal relations, it felt very cold. And she further said that being in bed with the Satan was very unpleasant because his feet were cloven and he had a tail. And this was her description of her sexual encounter with Satan. And this is very, very important because it highlights yet another distinction between men and women accused of witchcraft that can be traced back to the issue of familiars. There is no evidence that has survived, and as far as we know, there never was any evidence that says that men were ever involved in sexual relationships with Satan. This may very well just highlight the rampant misogyny that existed in the early modern period. Women were somehow much more easily and completely seduced by Satan. She was unwilling or unable to refuse him, despite the fact that sexual intercourse with Satan was very often described as unpleasant, as cold. The devil was not considered to be a very considerate lover. He would never stay afterwards and you know cuddle or anything like that. He would just leave immediately. And people were very, very you know, open about the fact they didn't actually enjoy having sex with Satan, but they felt compelled to have sex with Satan. So women are very, if you like, they're very easily penetrated by the devil, both morally and physically. It's something that they just cannot overcome. They are too weak. They are fragile. They are susceptible. And therefore, it's very, very easy for the devil to overcome them. And it makes them much more likely targets of Satan in the first place. And that's a very, very common assumption about women, that they are these very fragile creatures and that they are deluded by Satan very easily. But on the other hand, some researchers have suggested that because men who were accused of witchcraft were also accused of feeding familiars from their bodies, that they were accused of doing something that was not considered to be a masculine activity, almost universally in the animal kingdom, not absolutely, but almost. Most animals, there are, it's the, the female of the species who will feed offspring from their own bodies. It's very, very rare for you ever to hear about men who do, or male 
of the species to do the same thing. But in this case with the witches, men are being accused of this. And in, in the early modern context, this is a clear subversion of gender identity. This is not considered to be something that is masculine. It's not something that someone with manly attributes would do. And as such, these men who fed creatures from their bodies were desexualizing themselves. And as such, they would not be desirable sexual partners for Satan because they had lost their sexual identity because they had been demasculinized and they had no real sexual identity. And in that sense, it is a clear gender subversion. So really, the familiars are very, very important for multiple reasons because they do show a lot of differences between male and female experiences in the witch trials. And obviously, this is something that, again, varies from place to place. But in a lot of different countries where there are witch trials in England, in France, in the Basque region of Spain, there is a lot of evidence about this kind of relationship between <coughs> witches and familiars. And there do seem to be some consistent markers throughout that, that there are differences between how women are perceived to interact with their familiars and how men are perceived to interact with their familiars. And how people are examined, how people are treated, leads to a very real difference in experiences of men and women in witch trials. And that is all, so thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so questions? Um, since most of these are like seem to be done by Christians themselves, what did the church think about this? Like, like the church as a whole, did they like condemn it, or did they just kind of turn a blind eye to it? You mean the witch trials in general? Yeah. Oh no, they were very actively involved. Much of the the literature and much of the procedures and the structure and the the mechanisms that allowed the witch trials to take place were set up, first of all, by the Catholic Church, and then they were changed and refined and recodified by both the Lutheran and the Calvinist Church. All the churches, whether it was Protestant or Catholic, were very, very actively involved in the witch hunts. So, like, the Pope was, like, okay with it and everything? Very like much so. Okay. I mean, he was an active supporter in many instances of what was happening, and he gives... You know, a witch hunters very, very broad discretionary powers to do whatever they wanted to hunt out witches. It was considered to be the most serious threat to Christian Europe because, you know, it was considered to be treason against God. So people were very, very concerned about it, including the Pope. Uh, you mentioned that this was part of the uh, the uh, southeastern part of uh, Great Britain. How prevalent was this? In actuality, the entire uh, country. Was it, was it the entire country, or was it just like uh, specific hot spots? Or there always in most countries there are specific hot spots. You do find witch trials all over England, but in certain time periods they're clustered in certain regions. So in 1645 through 47, it's this particular area. In other time periods in English history, it's much further north. You do get it all over, but it never happens simultaneously everywhere. It happens in fits and bursts. Oh, hi. Uh, pretty hot topic here. Uh, have you ever thought about presenting something like this to the Wiccan community, just as you just presented it? Well, I've never been invited to, so no. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, so, if the witch finders were self-proclaimed, were they like? Did the church fund them or? How did that go down? What they would do would be they would move about from community to community and they would offer up their services. 
And if the, the different communities refuse to um, sanction their witch hunting activities, Matthew Hopkins would publish uh, a document or a, a diatribe against those communities that don't support his witch hunting activities and make thinly veiled threats and suggestions that the community leaders were actually involved in witchcraft themselves. So it comes to a point where very few communities are actually willing to speak up and say, absolutely not, we're not going to allow you to do this. A couple of communities in East Anglia do do this initially, but he very quickly gets the people of those communities on his side and the people start to question why these leaders are not weeding out the witches when there's a witch finder general, so there must be a real problem with witches. He's actually very, very effective at propaganda. At this point in the 1640s, the church, the Church of England and the Puritan churches don't really have the funds to, to give over to witch hunting because they are so bound up in civil war activities. That's where all funds are channeling. So most of the money that Hopkins gets comes from local communities who are afraid of witches, who levy special taxes to try and cover the cost of finding the witches. And that's really how he gets his money. And he's very, very good at it as well, because for every witch that he finds, he gets paid. And every time he fails to find a witch guilty, he doesn't get paid. So he has this real financial incentive to find those witches guilty. Uh, that kind of goes to my question, too. Was, was there, <clears throat> excuse me, was there anybody at all, specifically women, that stood up to this at all or had any kind of public opposition to this successfully? Sometimes, I mean, again, it really tends to depend on the circumstances. In this instance, I mean, in East Anglia in the 1640s, people are living in what we might think of as a culture of fear and paranoia. People are afraid constantly that, you know, someone is going to come and attack them. And people who are manipulative, like Matthew Hopkins, are very, very effective at playing into those fears and those concerns that people have. And of course, once they start, you know, addressing these concerns, and Matthew Hopkins, you know, very in a very thinly veiled way suggests that people who are royalists, people who support the king and the, the king's cause in the Civil War, those are witches. Those are the people who we need to look out for because they're the agents of Satan. So he plays into people's fears and paranoias that already exist, and he does so effectively. In other time periods and other places, depending on the circumstances, witches can demonstrate that they they are not really guilty of anything. And there are several very notable cases of people stepping forward and saying, no, this is not really what's happening. These people haven't actually done anything. You can't prove anything. And certainly the later we go through, I mean, the early witch trials in the early 1500s, that rarely happens. But the more and more that scientific methods develop and scientific knowledge comes to the fore, people are willing to come forward and say that this cannot actually happen. And they try to use... I mean, it's a very, very early example of sort of, you know, testing to try and show that these people are not witches. And they try and say, well, if you're a witch, do this. And of course, the witch can't actually perform any of the actions. And of course, other people will come back and say, well, she's just pretending she can't do it. But it is successful in some instances, not so much in others. So very much depends on time and place. Um, is there an uh, approximate number of people that were execute, executed during this time? Like, is there a... In the entire period of the witch hunts, best current estimates, and of course there's always records that are missing, and it doesn't take into account people who were killed by angry mobs with pitchforks, and it doesn't take into account people who die in prison while they're waiting to stand trial, or people who die under torture. People who are formally accused number about 60,000, and about half of those people were put to death. So about 30,000 people, thereabouts. Was it found um, that you were saying earlier that um, most of these witches were on the outskirts and were widowed or whatever it might mm -hmm. be, and then you talked about the male who had all the kids and um, 
and end up having them all killed or whatever it might be. But were any of the women or on record per se pregnant? Because when they were doing those tests with, in their genitalia per se, they were they able to kill the kids that they are having or I wasn't just sure about that. No, it's actually it's a really good question because it was one of the few avenues that women had to protect themselves if they were found guilty of witchcraft was to do, it actually had an official legal name, it's very charming, it's called pleading the belly and you claim that you're pregnant. And if you can successfully claim that you're pregnant, you cannot be executed for the crime of witchcraft until your baby is born because the theory is the baby hasn't done anything wrong yet. You know, once it's born, it's the child of a witch, so very likely it's going to be predisposed to evil. But a pregnant woman cannot be executed for the crime of witchcraft. So a lot of women would do this. They would claim to be pregnant and hope that they actually can A, get pregnant, or B, actually be pregnant. And that was one of the few avenues that they could protect themselves. And it actually was very, very effective because usually by the time the woman had gone through her gestation period and had delivered the baby, the conditions that caused the witch trial, the fear, the paranoia, had ended. And very often the women who were due to be executed were actually let off and they were not executed. A really good example is from the Salem witch trials. A woman called Elizabeth Proctor was pregnant when she was condemned. And by the time she has her baby, the Salem witch trials are over and she just gets to live out her life because people don't think that she was really a witch. So it does happen and it's actually a good thing for those women. You've uh, told us a lot about accusation, and I'm curious to know, uh, beyond pregnancy, does gender play a role in the conviction rate? And also, are there differences in execution methods along gender lines? No differences in execution methods. Most witches were hanged, and then they were burned. Once they were already dead, they were rarely ever burned alive. And the... In terms of the number of people who were convicted, the, it was actually very, very even about the same number, uh, the same proportion of men who were men and women who were accused were put to death for it. So about half of all the men who were accused were put to death, and about half of all the women who were accused were put to death. So the execution rates are actually very, very even and consistent. Uh, was there, um, <clears throat> I guess, other countries in the in the in the, around around there that were like that saw this happening in England and were like horrified by it, or? No, most other countries were okay. equally involved. There's actually only three areas that don't have a lot of witch hunting activity. There is some, but it's very, very limited. There are very few witch trials in Italy. There are very few witch trials in Spain and very few in Ireland as well. Those three areas do not have a significant amount of witch hunting activity. Not that they you know, condemned other countries for hunting for witches, but they just don't have it. All other territories, the Holy Roman Empire, modern day Germany, France, Scotland, they were all hunting for witches very, very actively. England actually was one of the um, least consistent in hunting for witches. Compared to other countries, there are not that many people accused in England, comparatively speaking. If you, you know, take the Matthew Hopkins episode out, he actually accounts for a lot of the witches who were convicted in the whole of English history. I guess I was just kind of... Uh Wondering too if, if the woman, when they were being accused of this, if they knew they were going to be accused of this, would try to escape and go somewhere else. And really, that was only an option if you were wealthy enough, and there are a few examples of that, but the vast majority of the people who were accused tended to be from the lower end of the economic spectrum, and in that case, it's not really possible. But if you had the money, you could bribe guards, you could escape, you could you know, find someone to take you in and hide you, but that takes financial resources, and very few people did that. The people who were accused who were wealthy certainly did, and there are you know, several examples of people with financial means escaping charges because they, they are wealthy. There's one really good example of a, a woman. Um, I just said that there were hardly any witch trials in Ireland, but of course it's in Ireland. And she is incredibly wealthy. She has lots of husbands. And she inherits all their fortunes, and people think that's a bit suspicious. And she uses her money and her connections to escape conviction. She actually runs off to England to avoid prosecution, and she leaves her son behind, and he has to get prosecuted in her 
in her stead because you know she leaves him. So they actually got someone from the family, just not the woman, because she didn't maybe have the money to pay for her son's escape, or she didn't really care about him. But she does use money to escape. You mentioned that in three areas, in Ireland, in Italy, and in Spain, there were relatively few trials and accusations. Mm -hmm. Is that because Catholicism was comparatively stable in those three areas? That's what a lot of people have suggested, um, that those were areas that were very minimally hit by the Reformation, and therefore they didn't have that kind of religious upheaval and dislocation and fear and paranoia. So there were fewer witch trials. Also, each of those areas had very for the most part, in the different Italian territories and in um, Spain and it, um, Ireland, they do have also very, for the most part, stable legal codes that are not, up, you know, they're not overthrown, they're not constantly being recodified. So it's just stable for multiple different reasons. To what extent would a parent go to protect their child if they noticed a birthmark or some, some other? Thing that might be confused with uh, the mark, and also, it, was there an age? Uh, you know, did did this witch hunt go down to a, as low as a child's age, or was it mainly reserved for the elderly? And in this particular witch hunt, there were not terribly many children accused. Maybe about three or four, and those children were in their their teens. Other witch trials, the youngest um, accused witch that I think is on record, which is, doesn't necessarily mean she is the youngest, was four years old. That's the youngest person we know of. And yeah, there were a lot of remedies. Some of them are you know, really horrific. There are reports of people, you know, painting lead-based solutions onto their children to try and cover up marks or to try and, you know, um, make the the marks or the moles go away, which of course causes hideous health problems in of themselves. But yeah, there's lots of folk remedies and methods that people could use to try and hide or get rid of birthmarks or other skin lesions or whatever they happen to be. You mentioned that um, Hopkins mm -hmm. um, disappears. Yeah. No one really knows what happened to him. Are there any theories on what happened to him or where he went? Yeah, there's there's lots. Nobody really knows for sure. There's actually there's a a poem or a song that's published in the 1660s that claims that he was actually found to be a witch himself and so a mob comes and attacks him and they basically rip him to pieces for killing all of these people when he himself is a witch but I think that's probably just a, a popular you know folk tale or, or not urban legend rural legend um, other theories claim that he and his family actually escaped to the, the so-called new world and the fact that the Salem witch trials are so very similar to what happened in East Anglia because they are very, very similar to one another, that Hopkins and his descendants were involved in that. There's absolutely no evidence for that either. People just suggest it. The most common theory is that he had some kind of lung disorder. There are other people who are writing about these trials while they're happening, and they keep talking about the fact that Hopkins has this horrible, you know, sort of wet lung hack constantly, and he's always coughing up blood. So there's some people who suggest he had a very serious respiratory illness, like tuberculosis or something, and that killed him. But again, if it did, there's no grave for him. There's no death certificate, so we really don't know, but probably the most mundane thing that he died is probably the one that's true. Were people relieved? Mm -hmm. Were the communities relieved that things ended, or were they...? They seem to be, because by 1647, people seem to have realized the sort of beast that they had awoken, that no one was really safe from a witchcraft accusation, and there are a lot of people, there are a lot of diary journal and journals and so on and so forth that do seem to express people being somewhat relieved that this is stopping now and that people don't have to be afraid that the witch hunter is going to come and knock at your door in the middle of the night and take away your, your mother or your sister or your child. So yeah, there is a lot of evidence that supports that. Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier that pregnancy was a, a defense, a viable mm -hmm. defense against uh, a witch uh, accusation. 
But what about the women who confessed to having the carnal relationships <clears throat> and had children? Um, you know, if they were looked at as the literal spawn of Satan, would would they be treated differently, or were they considered innocent also? No, they still had to wait until that child was was born. I think there's only one instance where that you know just so happens to line up that a woman is pregnant who also confesses that, and they do wait until she gives birth. But she actually, I don't know the medical name for it, but when you don't actually have a baby growing inside you, it's just a whole series of, um, not tumors, but growths, and so on. It does happen. It has a very disgusting clinical name, but that's actually what she gives birth to, and that's just taken as extra evidence that she did really have sex with Satan, so. Bad luck. Yeah, um, really. Well, you, you gave the one example, too, of the, of the woman who uh, she described having how she had sex with Satan and what it felt like. Everything mean, she had two children by him. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if those two children were treated differently or if they were just. And there was no record of those two children. Oh. They were never baptized if she really had them, okay. and they were not in her house. So if she really did have those children, they didn't exist. She she claimed that Satan took them away to hell with them because they were his children, but whether she just was delusional or, or she had had children at some other point in some traumatic circumstance they were lost to or we don't know. They just, those children did not really exist. In the beginning you said like, cause the Wizard of Oz, the witches are all seen as stereotypical. Mm -hmm. When did this go from something that thousands of people die where if it were something else like the Holocaust was taken seriously to with this being comedic, which is <laughs> Halloween. -y. I think it, it, it takes a it takes a very long time. I mean, even during the period of the witch trials, there were satirists who were making fun of what was happening. There was one um, Italian writer called Cesare Lanza who was making fun of the fact that in this time period a few lowly women can do what all the necromancers of the ancient world failed to accomplish. And so there are people even at the time who make fun of it and they make fun of the fact that, you know, witches for the most part are represented, you know, both in images and culturally as as old women, people laugh about that. Why would the devil want those people? to help them out. I mean, women are the weakest people in society. Why wouldn't he use more men who are much more powerful? So even during the period of the witch trials, there are people who are poking fun at this idea, this conception of witches as women. How it transforms into what we have today with people dressing up and so on and so forth, it's a very, very long evolutionary process that takes hundreds of years. It's it's something that just happens in fits and bursts. Once the witch trials come to an end, people are no longer as afraid of witches. In some cases, it takes a long time for those beliefs to die away. But over time, as people start to have other mechanisms for understanding the world, you know, scientific reasoning, again, that explains the bad stuff that happens. So it slowly changes over a very long period of time. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor Hendershot. Thank you. Ladies and